I'm Daniel Penny, and you're listening to Non-Toxic, a podcast where we connect the dots between the manosphere and the atmosphere. For most listeners of this show, Al Gore's 2006 documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, is likely the first time you heard about global warming, as it was then called, and probably the first time you really considered what its impacts might be for the future of life on this planet, or for your own future. But the truth is that people have been ringing alarm bells about the effects of CO2 and other greenhouse gases on our atmosphere for decades, and the science has been understood since the 19th century. In Losing Earth, a 2018 New York Times Magazine article turned book, Nathaniel Rich turns back the clock to 1979. Following the efforts of a group of scientists, elected officials, government experts, and environmental activists, as they first raise the alarm about the coming climate crisis, reach political consensus, and then, somehow, fail to get anybody to do anything about it. By 1989, the tides have turned, and what was once a bipartisan issue in the U.S. settles into the political division we know so well today, with Democrats tepidly supporting investments in climate mitigation and adaptation, and Republicans denying the science and resisting any change. What happened in those 10 years? How did our leaders and the public manage to fuck up so badly? And what can we learn from it? I found what's really incredible is there's a three-day meeting. It's sort of like three acts. It plays out in in essentially three acts from hope to conflict and ultimately a kind of desperation and tragedy by the end. And there's there's a transcript of the entire thing that I found in the National Archives. I think one of the great lessons of this period is that the absence of a strong moral claim by the advocates for this position led to their downfall. I sat down with Nathaniel Rich, who spoke to me from New Orleans. Sorry for the occasional drop in audio quality. We talk about his findings in Losing Earth, the process of going back to the archives and interviewing hundreds of people to put together this lost history, and how he thinks the climate discourse has shifted for the better since this story was first published six years ago. But before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to ask you, our listeners, to help support this show. If you've been following us since season one and you've been enjoying the many interesting conversations that we host here at Non-Toxic, and you haven't signed up yet to become a supporter, now is the time. Go to patreon.com slash nontoxicpodcast and you can choose from one of three different tiers of membership. Every little bit helps. Now here's our show. Nathaniel, thank you so much for coming on Non-Toxic. You're the author of Losing Earth, A Recent History, and more recently, a new book, Second Nature, which is, would you say it's a collection of essays? It's a collection of nonfiction stories organized around environmental themes and and specifically trying to understand where where things are headed and how to navigate the strangeness of this world that we've inherited and the increasing strangeness of the world that that will be our, our destiny. So if you like our conversation about losing Earth, go ahead and check out Second Nature as well. All right. I was really pleased to be able to snag you because Losing Earth, I remember, made such a big stir when it came out. And I think it's it's worth returning to a text like this outside the media cycle. And I think it's become one of those influential climate journalism books of the past few years. And it's definitely something that I've reached for as a journalist in this space. And I think it's a story that a lot of people still don't know. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to, to have the chance to, to speak about it with you. So I thought I'd ask initially just a question about the framing of this book. Your book recounts the efforts of a small group of activists, scientists, and politicians who came together in the 80s to prevent what they correctly saw as impending doom. The science was clear, the politicians were basically in agreement, and the public was behind them. And you write, Nearly everything we understand about global climate change was understood 
1979. But despite that understanding, our leaders still failed to do anything. And by the early 1990s, the fossil fuel industry had gone from studying climate change to denying it and had joined up with the Republican Party to make it a political issue. Why did you choose to focus on this period in your book, the 1979 to approximately 1989, with maybe a few moments that occur outside that? But why that 10-year span? Yeah, well, for a few reasons, one, one of which is the one that you mentioned in the introduction, which is that uh, it's a period of time that's largely been, you know, erased from the memory banks and, and, and which still people who are very close to the issue, you know, activists, people who work in politics, who study the issue, seem to have forgotten about or, or never knew much about, in, in part because it really doesn't resemble the, the, the terrain of that period, 79 to 89 period. The political terrain, the cultural terrain really doesn't resemble the status quo today. And so I kept finding things in, in reading about this period and talking to people. I, I spoke with more than 100 sources who were alive I can, during this I time. I can see and, you rubbing your head just remembering. Yeah, so that was the most was grueling but fascinating work that, that occupied a couple of, of years. But I kept having these moments of astonishment about how different things were and the sense of possibility that seemed to exist at the time. That's part of it. The other part of it was a, a narrative motivation, which is to say that since 1989, when my narrative ends, the story of climate change has been remarkably static. I mean, I'm generalizing it, obviously, here, but we've had a kind of paralysis since then where, you know, climate, em car carbon emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions have continued to rise. The politics is hardened. You have, at least in the U.S., a stark divide between the political par parties, a failure to get anything passed legislatively, a failure, you know, sort of parallel failure in the global meetings of the IPCC primarily to pass any kind of serious treaty. You know, you have this, this increasingly watered down treaty that's now called the Paris Accords, that's basically been a, a steady diminishment of the original promises and ideas of, 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 these, of, of a global treaty. And, and the you know, short version is nothing has really happened since 1989. The oil and gas industry has been dug in. And so I ultimately felt like it wasn't actually a very dramatic story to tell, and it has been told also many, many times, you know, the power of the oil and gas industry, the complete corruption of the Republican Party and, and being you know, bought out by the industry and the failure of the of the left in the U.S. to be able to motivate a, a majority of, of Americans, at least to prioritize the issue. And so this period of 79 to 89, by contrast, is a period of enormous possibility so it allowed me to tell both a story that hadn't been told, but also to examine more deeply why this, this problem has been so hard to, to solve and why even people who want to solve it under the best possible conditions have struggled and failed to do anything of consequence. Um, and then the final, I guess the final part of it is this, the stories of these people who are in the narrative are, are extremely dramatic and allow, I think, us to identify on a deeply personal level with a problem that, that is too often spoken about in a kind of abstract, scientific, technical way. It was a way to tell the human side of, of the story, a personal side of, of, of the story that I felt was lacking from a lot of, almost all of climate narrative. Let's talk about some of those people, because I think the story begins in kind of an unexpected way, it's a banal beginning. Essentially, a report lands on the desk of Rafe Pomerantz, and he's an environmental campaigner. He was working at the time as the coordinator of the National Clean Air Coalition. Is that correct? Right. He was a air quality activist, most specifically, and working on the Hill and, and a kind of inside guy within politics, although a very young man at the time. And he wasn't aware of climate change until he got this environmental assessment of coal liquefaction annual report, which talked about, by the way, like one of the unintended consequences of burning coal is going to be heating up the atmosphere. And this ignites in him basically like a decades long quest to try to 
get everybody on board to do something about it. Can you talk about that beginning and, and why you chose to set the story initially with him? Yeah, so Rafe Pomerantz is, is the original climate change activist. And for most of the 1980s was the only climate activist, which is an, another thing that I think is hard for people to understand. He was working at, at this, this group called Friends of the Earth, which was founded by David Brower, the Sierra Club. And, and you know, he was well placed within the environmental movement that had, had grown up in, during the 70s. He was a major figure within it, despite being a, a, you know, a young, young guy. And so you would think that someone in this position would know all about global warming, as it was then called, especially since the science of global warming had been understood for de- even by 1979, had been understood for decades, really since the late 50s, and understood that it was going to be a major problem. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because there were movies like The Unchained Goddess, which was part of the 1958 Bell telephone hour. And it's this scientific film produced by the director Frank Capra that pretty much lays out everything we know about global warming and its consequences. And this was in 1958. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. So talk of global warming was in the air, so to speak. And yet, Rafe Pomerantz was totally oblivious. And, and so he's reading this, this obscure government report in his office. As you say, and he, he comes a, across this crazy passing reference to an existential threat to civilization, you know, on page 66 of this report, and he can't really believe it. And I, I think he has the same kind of reaction that we all do. I, certainly the reaction that I did when I first came face to face with the magnitude of what we're up against. I think it's a human response to say, well, hold on, surely it can't be that bad. You know, sure, surely this, there's some way around it. And he goes through this whole kind of intellectual process, which is a kind of a, a version of the grieving process, denial and bargaining and, and all the rest, until he finally realizes, oh, this is, this is real. And the, the second part of that is, this is it's crazy that I didn't know this, and it's crazy that the government's not doing anything to stop it. And so that sets him on his path. And he, you know, I think maybe unlike most of us has the, has the, the stones to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one to tell the government. And he was, he was perfectly placed to do so. And so the, thus begins a kind of tour of, of the Carter administration that he embarks on trying to tell everybody there's this impending disaster and the White House needs to act immediately. And the Carter administration was maybe going to be more amenable to environmental problems than than I would say most other administrations of the second half of the 20th century. Here's President Carter at his inauguration speech for the solar panels that went on top of the White House during the oil crisis. I think all of us working together can assure the success of what is being initiated this afternoon, a national program supported and enjoyed by all Americans to make solar energy a clean, sure, economical, exciting part of Americans' lives. Thank you very much. But obviously, Carter doesn't stay in the White House. Reagan comes into office. And so he has to kind of change tack, right? It becomes something for legislators rather than the executive branch because the Reagan administration is totally uninterested in anything having to do with the environment, except maybe like gutting environmental regulations. That was their main interest. Right. Yeah. I mean, the first shock for Rafe, I think, is that the Carter administration, instead of acting forcefully and immediately, instead says, OK, let's we need to do some more meetings and, and academic studies and just make sure that the scientists are in agreement. 
even though it was very clear that they, they were. And the result of this was this, this major report, the Charney report, that essentially crystallizes climate science as we know it in a few pages. And it's kind of another kind of boring report, but, but that puts forth basically what the expectations are for climate change over the next 50 to 100 and has remained accurate, I should say, since then. And yet, as you say, it's also a kind of bureaucratic way of letting the clock run out because Reagan comes in, Carter, when Carter doesn't win re-election, gets trounced, everything shifts. Reagan begins this full assault on environmental regulation to which this sort of nascent climate change effort, it becomes a casualty. And the whole environmental movement is thrust back on onto uh, defense and is forced to not just defend sort of the status quo, but, but, you know, Reagan's basically trying to pull out any kind of environmental policy that's been instituted since Teddy Roosevelt, just about. And so, so they, they are, they have their hands full just trying to pre protect, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency to try to protect the Environmental Council within the White House, to try to protect national parks, stop you know, basic conservation efforts. And so climate change really takes its thrust into the backseat for a number of years to the point where by the mid 80s, Pomerantz feels essentially like all is lost. And he, he kind of has this moment in the wilderness where he has a personal, really like an emotional breakdown and feels that he doesn't see a way, a way forward. I want to talk about a different character who has also continued to be prominent in the climate movement, but didn't begin as an activist at all. And that's James Hansen, who was a, a NASA scientist and whose models were integral to the early science of predicting what the effects of climate change would be and, and how the Earth would heat up. This is a clip of Hansen speaking at a 1988 congressional hearing and speaking pretty forcefully, I might add. The evidence that the Earth is warming by an amount which is too large to be a chance fluctuation represents a very strong case, in my opinion, that the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. Who is James Hansen and how did he go from this obscure scientist studying the atmosphere of Venus to somebody testifying at a Senate committee. Yeah, he's a, he's a, a guy from Iowa, a real uh, mid Midwestern sensibility, very serious, very persistent, and unafraid to follow evidence where it takes him. You know, all all important qualities to to have as a scientist. Also, he had the characteristics, the sort of pers the personality that made him a trustworthy figure when it came to politics. And, and as you said, he was studying, you know, he, he started studying astronomy and, and later found his way to NASA, first studying Venus and, and essentially the greenhouse effect on Venus. And NASA asked him to look at the greenhouse effect on Earth. And he became very alarmed by what he was seeing in the literature and from what he was seeing in his studies about the effect of fossil fuels burning fossil fuels on, on the global atmosphere and on the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And he started publishing a series of papers that, you know, very early, I think 1980 is the first time that the, the New York Times publishes on the, the front page of the, of the newspaper some of his findings about the acceleration of, of the greenhouse effect. One thing that he does that, that distinguishes him is he concludes in his papers that we should stop burning coal <laughs> and ultimately oil and gas. And it's, it sounds sort of obvious, I guess, uh, especially to perhaps a listener today that, oh, yes, if, if burning these things is going to cause these massive, the massive destabilization, we should probably stop doing it. Sure. But it, it was very unorthodox, those early papers that got the attention of journalists, that raised the ire of some of his colleagues at NASA and, and, and beyond, and attracted the interest of Rafe Pomerantz, who saw a connection between the science and where the government policy should go. So he worked hard to put Hansen in front of TV cameras, really beginning in the early 1980s. After the break, 
We'll talk with Nathaniel Rich about a big meeting set in an unusual hotel on the Gulf Coast, full of scientists and experts who were charged with putting together proposed legislation for Congress to stop carbon emissions and prevent global warming, and how it is that they fucked it all up. This episode of Non-Toxic is sponsored by Blue Corn Candles, a Colorado-based company that's been making handcrafted beeswax candles since 1991. Most candles in the market are made of paraffin, a diesel byproduct that's literally scraped from the bottom of the barrel. Blue Corn Candles are made from sustainably harvested and lightly filtered beeswax. The candles smell great, burn super slowly, and most importantly, they don't produce any toxic fumes. For the first time, Blue Corn has launched a new line of scented candles based on the rugged landscapes of Colorado. From the sagebrush-covered foothills of Ridgeway to the pine forests of Telluride. During these dark months, Blue Corn is running a special deal for non-toxic listeners. Enter the code NONTOXIC, that's one word, all caps, at checkout to receive 10% off your order. Shipping within the U.S. and internationally. And now, back to our show. One of the central scenes in the book is a meeting between all of the scientists and experts at the time at kind of unusual venue, the, the Don Caesar, in, which is a hotel on Florida's Gulf Coast that's known as the Pink Palace. Uh, of, of course, at the time, they wouldn't necessarily have thought about it, but I suspect this is a hotel that's particularly in danger of being flooded now as sea levels rise. And members of the National Commission on Air Quality, they all went there and they were supposed to draft some legislation to address the findings from that Charney report that you mentioned. Can you talk about that scene and, and why it was such a pivotal point in the narrative of this book? It's an incredible moment. And it's, I think it's really the heart of the whole story for me. I think you could tell the whole story really through that one scene, frankly. It's, it's a meeting that takes place days before the Reagan, Reagan wins uh, the first time at the end of the Carter administration. And they're charged with creating legislation to do it. Congress has, has asked them to essentially write a bill. This is 1980, you know, a bit naive perhaps, but write a bill that's going to deal with this problem. And all these well-intentioned people get together and they cannot agree on anything. Yeah, it's like 20 or 25 people trying to solve the problem who understand it very well, who are debating with each other, essentially experts, scientists, but you also have politicians and philosophers. Of course, Exxon sends its representative, Henry Shaw. He is there, but his, his position is, is not quite, you know, it's not like who Exxon would send maybe in 1989 or 1992, say, in that he's, he, he's cautious, but he's not denying anything. And, you know, I found what, what's really incredible is there's a three-day meeting. It's sort of like three acts. It plays out in, in essentially three acts from hope to conflict and des ultimately a kind of desperation and tragedy by the end. And there's a, there's a transcript of the entire thing that I found in the National Archives. It's never been, the meeting has never been reported. There's minimal press coverage at the time. I think of it almost as like a 12 angry men uh, of climate change where they're trying to debate what to do. And you see all of the, the anxieties and hopes and conflict that comes out even, you know, even before you have the death star of industry and the Republican party coming into the scene that there's deep discord and, and, and also a kind of squeamishness about taking in major action. It encapsulates all of the broader, you know, human and philosophical debates that we've had ever since, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing that people are saying at cop, you know, this year that isn't doesn't reflect some aspect of, of what they were saying back then they understood the science they understood the political reality and they understood the, sort of the politics of it and and essentially you know a lot of it is about a lot of their debate stands on well are people really willing to act now to diffuse a bomb that's going to go off many years from now it's also interesting thinking about that moment because Oil was really expensive still. I think, you know, we still had the OPEC oil crisis. And I think there was an appetite on the part of 
American politicians and even American energy companies like Exxon wasn't calling itself an oil company. It was calling itself an energy company. And they were doing all kinds of research on, you know, solar panels. And, yeah, all sorts of things. So like they were much more diversified in their approach at, or certainly how they imagined the, the future of the company would be. Um, and so the, as you say, their, their representative wasn't there to be an obstructionist. And yet the, the personalities of the people and I guess the kind of habits of mind that scientists were and still are often trapped within the difficulty in making a direct recommendation or making an unqualified statement, that that really hampered them from issuing something firm. Yeah, and just a general um, cautiousness. And you can see Rafe and a couple other people in this group losing their minds, you know, the, in, the, in the transcript by, by the end of it, just being so frustrated that even people who understood the problem perfectly, who understood it as they did, still could not bring themselves to, call, to, to commit to calling for major reform in the way things are done. That the, the sense of, of inertia, political inertia, social inertia, inertia, cultural inertia was so strong that radical, the kind of radical shifts that would be necessary to really forestall some of the worst case scenarios still felt too ambitious and, and no one was really willing to, you know, put their money where their mouth was. And so once it came down to actually writing a recommendation, every clause became, you know, the, it was the same kind of thing you see now at, at the, at the, you know, the IPCC meetings that deep arguments over every single clause, every single statement, inserting a lot of conditionals when they really should have been declaratives. And, and the thing just becomes this mealy masked mess. And by the end, they can't even, not only can they not issue any kind of legislative directions, they can barely write a statement of purpose, you know? So they have this very weak paragraph that comes out of these, you know, hours and hours and hours of meetings over three days that is sort of so indecisive that it that it's it's meaningless i want to jump ahead a few years to 1988 you mentioned the ipcc which most listeners will probably think of as that body that issues really scary reports every few years but that wasn't just the point of the IPCC when it was formed. Can you talk a little bit about how the IPCC was created and, and how that was a part of this story and, and why it is the way it is today? Yeah, so in the early 80s, um, it was understood that you, you know the, the world had to cut down on its greenhouse gas emissions, but it was unclear what mechanism would be used to do so. Is it, could it, you know, voluntary seemed... Like it wouldn't work, but then, you know, global laws didn't seem to work. And part of the, the frustration in the early years of the 80s was to figure out, well, you know, how do you actually do this in practice? It's not enough to want to do it. You have to have some kind of laws or some kind of agreements. And in 1986, 87, for the first time, a new kind of government agreement came into existence, which is we now refer to it as the Montreal Protocol, which is the global agreement to reduce uh, CFC emissions, basically the chemicals that create the ozone hole. Listeners so the, of this podcast can go check out episode six of season one for more on that story. There you go. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. And, it, and it's the first example of a global environmental treaty. I mean, the idea of a global environmental problem was itself a, a fairly new idea that, that was not intuitive to a lot of the environmental movement that, that sprung up in, 19, in the 70s, which tended to focus on very localized environmental sort of travesties. And so here was an agreement signed by most of the countries in the world to take a concerted collective action. And once that passed, that was a kind of proof of concept of this idea of a global environmental treaty. And so Pomerantz and, and the rest of the, the sort of climate parties said, okay, we need to do a you know, Montreal Protocol for climate change. And you had even the head of Reagan's EPA saying exactly that at the signing of the Montreal Protocol. He said, you know, we're going to do this again, and next time we'll do it for global warming, just to give you a little bit of a 
sense of how through the looking glass the politics were back then. And so beginning in 88, 89, you have the first meetings of diplomats under the auspices of this newly formed organization to figure out the climate version of Montreal Protocol. And the original idea was essentially a, a increasing ban on greenhouse gas emissions with some kind of binding mechanism. And so the very first the first iteration of this process was by far the strongest. The, the proposal was essentially a, an agreement that would have been brokered by the U.S. to reduce globally greenhouse gas emissions and that there would be a bunch of enforcement mechanisms that were to be incorporated in the agreement to f- compel countries to act. What, what kind of enforcement mechanisms are we talking about? Essentially, I mean, there are a few different proposals that were in, in bills that were introduced in Congress, very ambitious climate bills in, in 1988 and 89, which is sort of the, the high point of congressional action on these issues for, for many for decades after. And they were forms of, you know, denying funding, denying payment to other countries, the same kind of, same kind of things you see in trade agreements to sort of foreign policy levers to to sanction other countries if they failed to hit their benchmarks. That's, um, that's really hard to now, imagine today. <laughs> very hard to imagine. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. And, and even at the time, there were people like particularly John Sununu and the Bush White House who said that these are, this is fantasy, that there's no, we're not going to be able to compel anybody to take action on on this in the same way that we might be able to compel them to you know, we might issue sanctions for human rights violations. We're not going to issue sanctions for failure to reduce emissions. And yet, you know, that was what was on the table back then. And it was seen as a reason, reasonable pass, but certainly nothing was settled. And, and very quickly, the whole prospect of, of any kind of sanctions or, you know, penalties started to, to fall apart um, once they got to the negotiating table. Let's talk about John Sununu. For listeners who don't remember who he is he's the former governor of New Hampshire. He was Bush's chief of staff. And in the book, you cast him as one of the earliest and most strident skeptical voices who hobbles that push for serious climate action. What exactly is his role in this story? And how much blame do you assign to him in failing in the US failing to pass any kind of binding climate legislation? Like, is it Something about him in particular, or would there have been another John Sununu if he hadn't been the one to grind things to a halt? I think there's only one John Sununu. Yeah. You know, I was, I was, I was, it, it, I was thrilled and sort of surprised that he would speak to me, and he spoke with me at length and very enter- entertainingly, I should say. And I was reporting the piece. I don't think he's spoken to anyone ever, ever since, certainly about this issue. But he unfortunately occupied a position of unique power within the George H.W. Bush White House, where he was able to stop a, a very serious effort within the administration led by the head of Bush's EPA to try to broker a global treaty on climate change. Why was he so against Bush taking any kind of action on climate change? It's a unique figure. He's essentially the original denialist, although his, the, the form of his climate denialism is different than the kind of denialism that would, would come to dominate the Republican Party and, and the oil and gas industry. This came about, I think, fairly honestly and organically in that he was a scientist himself, a PhD, and had worked on computer models, very different than the kind of models that were used by, by Hansen and, and climate scientists, but, but similar enough that it gave him the sense, and he's an extraordinary egotist, a megalomaniac of the first, first class. And it, and it was enough for him to, to, to say with confidence, these models that these scientists are using are total bunk. And he played around with them himself. And, you know, of course he was wrong, but, but he felt that the science was wrong. And I, I think he sincerely felt that. He also was very concerned by the very idea of scientists telling politicians how to act, guiding major national and international policy. And this reflected 
essentially a kind of communist conspiracy thinking that there were these sinister leftist forces that for, for generations, you know, predating uh, global warming, had been trying to use scientific theories to institute kind of authoritarian governments and govern measures. And, and so he would cite the scare about the population bomb in the 70s as part of that. Here's a clip of Sununu at a debate at MIT in 1990. And he's trotting out a lot of the rhetoric that you're talking about. I, I uh, have two examples in my mind that are always the nightmare examples of, of public policy. Um, and fortunately, they did not get acted on, even though there was a, a momentum uh, established. One is uh, the global, global cooling phenomena that the comet was supposed to produce. And the other was the Club of Rome the world is going to end tomorrow scenario, no matter what you do. And, and both of those, uh, I think, are excellent examples of, of at least some constituencies out there who, who constantly seem to be looking for calamitous surrogates to uh, creating uh, anti-growth, anti-dynamic investment policies. And uh, the impact on billions of people in terms of their standard of living and quality of life that, that decisions of that kind can make is, is got to be put on the ledger someplace. And so he came out of that kind of intellectual theory and, and then his own scientific background to this place where he decided that, that this was another conspiracy and that the science was, was bad. And, you know, then he was out, you know, after a couple of years, after he had thwarted the, the process in 1989, which I write about in Lanes and Losing Earth, he lost his position because of a scandal, but by then he had basically. And what was um, that scandal? I think it's it's kind of funny. Well, part of it was he he would it was caught taking private jazz. These are military planes. So I think even Air Force One to dentist appointments in New Hampshire. You know, he's the kind of guy who felt like he could get away with anything, and he really did for a long time. And Bush trusted him completely. Extremely overbearing, obnoxious, horrible. But by the time he was actually. You know, pushed out of the White House, still in, 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 you know, maybe two years into the administration, the whole political temperature on this issue had turned and Bush's economic council had come down against taking action. And so he wasn't really needed anymore by that time. But he was in this position of power and leverage in this critical moment in 1989 when there was a chance to ratify, at least formalize this most ambitious version of a global treaty. And if he wasn't there, if he, if any, or if he didn't win that power battle, who's to say what would have happened? Now, in prior interviews, I've heard you say that the problem is that we don't discuss climate change as a moral crisis. But I find that losing Earth isn't really a tale of morality. There are, other than Sununu, barely any villains. And it's more like, a tragedy about the incompetence and stupidity of American political and technocratic leaders. And I know that that's been a criticism of the book or when it was an article as well in places like The Atlantic that didn't assign enough blame um, or didn't do enough kind of judging in moral terms. What do you think about those criticisms? I feel like the story is, is, is absolutely a moral parable. I mean, there, there's... It's ab yes, there's, of course, enormous personal failings, technical failings. But I think if you take a step back, I think a conclusion, an inescapable conclusion is that if you if you remove the moral aspect of it and just assign it to technocrats to figure out, you're back in the Don Cesar Hotel and you're doomed to failure. And I think one of the great lessons of this period is that the absence of a strong moral claim by the advocates for this position led to their downfall. So, you know, Rafe made that claim, but, but he was in the background, you know, and the people who were in the foreground, who were arguing the case to the American people, who were arguing the case to politicians and on the global stage, were speaking in terms of cost-benefit analysis. What's the right mechanism? What's the right leisure? This is about the state of civilization. And so once you get into the kind of arcane business of climate policy, 
if you're not grounded in a sense of the major human stakes to the issue, things are inevitably going to fall apart. Do you think climate activists have gotten better about making moral claims? Climate activism has really learned since then from, you know, people like Greta Thunberg or, or you know, Ocasio Cortez and and the, the birth of the Sunrise Movement and the Extinction Rebellion and all the rest that are not making the old claims about how it would be really prudent if we act now because we know where, we know the science, we know where things are going, we know that if we don't act now, it'll be it'll be worse and so on. This kind of language you start to see after 2018 and that, that midterm election in the U.S. and you have a sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office by climate activists is a personal language and it's an appeal to common humanity and, and saying that you know if we fail to act, we are betraying the very core principles of who we are of what our democracy stands for. We are sentencing people all around the world to disease and injury and death and 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 all kinds of other trickle down you know disasters and so there's a, a, a much deeper human understanding of the issue that I think was lacking from the language. The story of this period shows the flaws of relying on appeal to reason. Nathaniel, uh, I think is a great note to end on. Thank you so much for coming on Non-Toxic. It was a pleasure to have you. Uh, the book is Losing Earth, A Recent History. Nathaniel is also the author of Second Nature and many other books, which you can find at your local bookstore. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. It's great talking to you. Losing Earth recounts such a pivotal period in recent history that it feels like it should be better known. Rafe Pomerantz, James Hansen, John Samunu. These weren't elected officials, but their efforts to advance or stall American action on climate change shaped the course of events for decades to come. After my conversation with Nathaniel Rich, I was left wondering how our own moment in the climate crisis will be remembered. Will historians think of this as the decade when we flattened the curve and started the long process of lowering emissions back to pre-industrial levels? Or will it be another series of missed opportunities, weakly phrased international deals that failed to deliver real change? And who will be the protagonists of this next chapter? That depends, I suppose, on all of us. And that's it for this episode of Non-Toxic. Next week, I'll be talking with Alec Leach, author of The World's on Fire and We're Still Buying Shoes, about why we buy clothes we don't need, how to learn to love the things we're with, and how a certain kind of male fashion aficionado, the so-called hype beast, has come to define modern consumption. Non-Toxic is produced by Loose Thread Studios with help from Andrew Lewis. Our music is by Nathan Sharp, and our art is by Sam Creasy. Our sponsor this season is Blue Corn Candles, but most of our support comes from listeners like you. If you'd like to help keep detoxifying the discourse, go to patreon.com slash non-toxic podcasts and sign up today. Your support means everything to us.